Before we begin, I want to thank Kamikoto for sponsoring this video. Kamikoto makes great Japanese steel knives using traditional techniques from Japan. The knives come beautifully presented in an ash wood box. The knives themselves are handcrafted using techniques that date back to the Edo period of Japan. Each knife goes through a 19 step process that takes several years from start to finish. All Kamikoto knives are individually inspected for quality and come with a lifetime guarantee. I was very pleased with the quality of these knives. They have a good weight in the hand and cut right through even the tougher root vegetables. Kamikoto is currently having a sale on all its products and you can get an additional $50 off by going to kamikoto.com slash the missing enigma or clicking the link in the description and using the promo code missing enigma. On the evening of January 12th, 2015, Lindsay Gardner left her home at the Coffee Creek Apartments in Fort Worth along with her 13-month-old daughter, Haley. She had told her husband, Anthony, that she was leaving to stay the night at her parents' home in order to be closer to work in the morning. After Lindsay walked out the door, Anthony noticed she had forgotten her jacket and attempted to run and catch up to her. He was only able to catch a glimpse of Lindsay's 1996 gold Toyota Camry as it drove off into the night. The time was between 11 and 11.30 p.m. and this was the last time Anthony saw his wife and child. At around 9.15 a.m. the next morning, a woman named Amber Bentley called 911 after noticing an accident near the intersection of Alta Mesa Boulevard and Bryant Irvin Road. Police, operator K10, what address are you calling about? Hi, um, I am at 6801 Dirks Road. Um, there is a car that has went off the road. I called my OnStar company a while ago, and they were supposed to dispatch somebody. I don't know have anybody here yet, and I can't go and see if they're okay because I have my son in the car, and they went through the fence. Now, there's a cop right down the street, and I don't know if he's coming this way or not. He's kind of in the Goodwill parking lot. Okay. Um, what color is the car? It's like a gold four-door sedan. It's hit a tree. I don't know how long it's been there. It's behind some brush. It's kind of difficult to see. Okay, um, so you didn't see the accident happen. You just see the I car I didn't down. see it, no. Okay. No, it caught my eye because it's like against the tree. Um, and then you could tell where it went off the road at, and there's a cop, like, probably 100 yards from me. Let me get your name and number. Amber Bentley. And my number is 817-8, ah, there he comes, 845. Okay. Is he coming to you or just forward? Yes. Yes, he is. Awesome. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, that's okay, <laughs> because you might know if it's an old accident or not. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. During the call, Amber was able to flag down a nearby police officer and bring his attention towards a gold Toyota Camry that had apparently run through a barricade, then through multiple barbed wire fences surrounding a cow pasture, before crashing head-on into a tree. Nobody was found on scene and Lindsay's wallet with ID was found in the vehicle. The officer assumed it was a hit and run, with the occupants having fled. He subsequently left the scene unattended. Then, shortly after 11 a.m., the owner of the property, John Centrell, would arrive and discover the accident with nobody around. He subsequently called 911 to report the incident. We got a call to 911 from the phone. Do you have an emergency? Well, yes and no. It's probably not an emergency. I needed to get a sheriff's department down here. I've had a there's been an accident. There's nobody here, but the car's still left in my pasture, and uh, I didn't know what else to do. But now I'm 911, and um, I'm, it's not exactly an emergency. Okay. Where is it at now? It's on Dirks Road, across from the Goodwill uh, Donation Store. It's at the where Brian Irvin dead's in the Dirks Road. 
Okay. And the vehicle's there, but no one is, is at the location? No, no one's here at the location. What kind of vehicle is it? It's a... Looks like an older... No Camry. What color? Uh, gray. Okay, what did he hit? and gray. Huh? What did he hit? Well, he went through... She... Her licenses and everything still in the car. She went through the fence. She went through the barricade and through my fence and through my pasture and jumped the fence and then hit into a dead end tr to a tree. Okay. Did you see which way she left? Mm, well, she didn't leave. The car still sitting there, but she's not here. Right. So did you see which way she ran? No. I, I didn't even see the accident. They called me and told me, I got cows in here, and I've got to get this fence fixed back up mm -hmm. so my cows won't get out. I've got a feeling somebody came and picked her up. And there's a baby seat in the back, so there must have been a baby in the car. All right, we're going to get somebody out there, okay? An officer would arrive around 11.30 a.m. and begin documenting the scene. Initially, he found no blood, evidence of injury, or injured persons. The driver's side door was found open, the keys were still in the ignition, and Lindsay's wallet was laying on the seat. The officer found that the vehicle was heading westbound on Alta Mesa Boulevard when it crossed the eastbound traffic lanes at the intersection to Bryant Irvin Road. The vehicle then collided with a city-owned red and white barricade before going off-road as it continued westward. It then crashed through roughly 35 yards worth of barbed wire fencing before continuing on through the cow pasture. Then crashed through another barbed wire fence before going airborne as it hit the side of a nearby access road. The vehicle landed in an open field and then continued until it finally collided with a tree. John Centrell approached the officer letting him know that he was the owner of the land and in the process of repairing the fence line so that the cows did not escape. The officer then went back to his vehicle and began sketching a diagram of the scene. While doing so, Mr. Centrell approached his window and said he could possibly see two bodies located in the pasture by the fence line to the gas well. The officer states in his report that he initially did not see the bodies because a herd of grazing cattle were surrounding them when he first arrived on scene. The cattle had then wandered off, and Mr. Centrell subsequently noticed the bodies as he was repairing the fence. The officer walked over to the area and found a deceased female lying on her stomach with no clothes on. It was the body of Lindsay Gardner. Underneath Lindsay, the officer discovered one-year-old Haley, also deceased and completely naked. The area then became a crime scene with detectives called in to analyze the evidence. They arrived shortly before 2 p.m. and began to process the scene while taking many photographs that show the layout and locations of many items. Detectives searched the vehicle but found few things of interest. Lindsay's shoes were on the driver's side floorboard with one shoe wedged underneath the gas pedal. They found plenty of baby clothes and accessories but no alcohol or narcotics. Officers had found a pile of clothing 26 yards south of the vehicle crash site. The clothes were photographed and determined to be the clothes that both Lindsay and Haley were wearing when they crashed. The bodies were located roughly 200 yards east of the car and had since been covered with a blue blanket. Detectives noted that it appeared Lindsay had collapsed face first in an east-west orientation while carrying Haley in her arms. The bottoms of her feet were caked with dried mud and she had numerous scrapes and scratches on her arms, legs, and back. Abrasions were noticed on both knees as well. Haley was found on her back in a north-south orientation and was found to have scratches and abrasions on her body as well. They were unable to find any clear indications for what caused both deaths as neither had any severe external traumas. Detectives subsequently flew over the scene to take aerial photos of the accident. 
The clothing that was found was given a thorough examination and red stains were noticed on numerous different pieces. The reports never indicate that these red stains were tested by any laboratory. The bodies of both Lindsay and Haley were subsequently given over to the Tarrant County Medical Examiner to determine cause of death. By March 6 of 2015, the medical examiner determined hypothermia with paradoxical undressing as the cause of death. Paradoxical undressing is a phenomenon that sometimes occurs in cases of hypothermia where an individual feels incredibly hot in their last moments and subsequently sheds their clothing. Toxicology results came back negative for both drugs and alcohol. The medical examiner called it a very sad and unusual case and something he had only seen a couple times. Still, there are quite a few lingering questions regarding this incident, beginning from the time Lindsay left her home at the Coffee Creek Apartments. When interviewed, Lindsay's husband, Anthony, had stated, I don't even understand why she was in that area in the first place because it was the total opposite direction of her parents' house. Lindsay began her journey going in the wrong direction, and the exact cause of her crash was never determined. One theory is that her vehicle accelerator broke and forced the car to speed up uncontrollably and crash. 1996 Toyota Camrys were found to have this defect in a small number of cases that led to the deaths of others. This theory may be supported by the fact that Lindsay's shoe was found lodged beneath the accelerator. Perhaps the pedal got stuck in a downward position and she tried forcing her foot beneath it to push it back up again. Since the case was deemed an accident, the vehicle was never thoroughly checked by authorities, at least not in any reports that I was able to find. The time of the crash was never pinned down exactly, though a separate 911 call put in during the initial investigation does reveal some useful information. Ford, police Hello? Yes, this is Ford, police department, not better case help out three, may help you. Uh, yes, ma'am. My name is Eric Griffin. I'm a shift supervisor with Stevens Transport uh, Tanker Division. Um, I was talking to one of my night drivers, and um, the incident that is going on out at uh, Bryant Irving and uh, Alta Mesa, um, he, was, he, he, he was at that scene last night at about 1.30. He seen the car. He stopped. He looked around. He tried to see if there was anybody in the car didn't see nobody, and he thought it was somebody just drunk, wrecked the car, and walked home. Um, I don't know if that information would be helpful for him, but that was at 1.30 this morning. Given this information, we can figure that the crash happened sometime between 11.30 p.m. and 1.30 a.m. Given the distance between Lindsay's home and the crash site is only around two and a half miles, it could have possibly occurred only minutes after she left home. The accident was not actually reported to police until around 9 a.m. The temperature during this time was in the mid-30s, or around 1 to 2 degrees Celsius. The crash occurred within sight of many houses and a goodwill outlet. If a person was acting rationally, they could have sought help which was easily within walking distance. Lindsay, however, walked straight into an open cow pasture. I considered that perhaps the crash knocked Lindsay unconscious, and when she finally awoke, she was already in the late stages of hypothermia. Then she removed herself and her child from the vehicle, took off all their clothing, and walked in a daze for roughly 500 feet before collapsing. But this theory has numerous faults. No head trauma was noted during the autopsy. And I've read about many cases of paradoxical undressing, but I think this is the only case I've ever seen where an individual paradoxically undresses someone else. Then there's the scratches. The ground that Lindsay walked across, in general, is flat and grassy. Though some bushy areas can be seen in certain photographs, none seem to be the height of an adult woman or in the direct path to the location of the bodies. It seems difficult to explain where all the numerous scratches and abrasions came from on both mother and child, 
as most of them must have occurred after the crash and subsequent undressing. Early theories that narcotics or alcohol played a part in this case were later dispelled by the toxicology results. What we are left with is a bit of a mystery. Though Lindsay and Haley were only missing for a matter of hours, the things that transpired in that short time and what caused them are virtually unknown. <laughs>